morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of, of the conference and our opening session, Masterclass One. And we're, it's on material cultures of childhood. And we're incredibly privileged to, to have two uh, guest speakers and hosts for this session. Um, and are uh, Andrew Parkin, who's the Keeper of Antiquities at the Great North Museum, University of Newcastle, and Dr. Sally Waite, who is a lecturer in classics and classical archaeology at Newcastle University. And they're going to give us some insight into the collection at the museum at Newcastle, and also some of their thoughts on the material cultures of childhood, which hopefully will tie in with a lot of the discussions that were being had yesterday and in some of the papers uh, across time periods throughout this conference. So I'll hand over straight to, to you two. Thank you very much, April. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, hopefully this will work. There we go. OK, uh, so Sally and myself are going to talk a little bit about material cultures of childhood. Obviously, this is a massive, massive topic. Um, we're going to reduce it down to <laughs> just a very few uh, small areas and we're going to focus as well on the uh, Greek and Roman world because that's where we're most comfortable and we're going to have a look at some of the types of evidence you might encounter and very briefly outline some of the issues to consider when working with material culture. Before we do that though uh, a little bit of background about where I work. So I'm Keeper of Archaeology at the Great North Museum, Hancock, which is a, a museum in the city of Newcastle upon Tyne. It's actually on the edge of uh, Newcastle University's campus. And uh, in many respects, it is a university museum, although there are other organizations involved in the running and the upkeep of the museum. The museum basically brings together a lot of different collections that are based in the city of Newcastle. So we have uh, the collections of the Natural History Society of Northumbria. We have the collections of the Society of Antiquaries of Newcastle upon Tyne. And we also have material that belongs to Newcastle University. So the museum has a really, really broad range of uh, objects on display and uh, this slide just gives you an indication of some of that range uh, with our biology gallery here uh, showing you lots and lots of different uh, forms of uh, wildlife but also there's uh, our British prehistory gallery here uh, which looks at the prehistory of the northeast of England and the collections also encompass ethnography, Egyptology and geology so there's a wide range of material in the museum. But I want to just really look at uh, material from Greece and Rome. And we have two galleries devoted to the Greek and Roman world. The Greek gallery is called the Shefton Gallery of Greek and Etruscan Art and Archaeology. And it takes its name from Brian Shefton, who taught Greek archaeology at Newcastle University from 1955 up until his retirement in 1984. And Shefton was responsible for building up the Greek collection in Newcastle. He established the collection and developed it initially as a teaching resource, although now it's uh, much more widely uh, appreciated by our audience. And we have getting on for a thousand different objects from the ancient Greek and Etruscan worlds. The other gallery we're going to have a look at and talk about some of the objects from is our Hadrian's Wall Gallery. And this uh, essentially houses the collections of the Society of Antiquaries of Newcastle upon Tyne. And uh, we're one of the, we're the only museum associated with Hadrian's Wall that has material from every site along the length of the wall. And uh, we'll have a look at some objects from this gallery uh, that are relevant to the topic of material cultures of childhood. 
Before we actually look at some specific objects, uh, we're going to talk about some uh, general issues. And I think an important question to address here is why use material culture? Uh, what sort of reasons are there for wanting to use material culture to understand childhood? And uh, I've just put down a few reasons on this slide here. Uh, I think uh, generally there has been a material turn, and you often see this referred to in the literature uh, from the 1970s onwards. And disciplines across the arts, humanities and social sciences have uh, experienced a real upturn in interest in material culture, uh, which is what is referred to as a material term. Then if we think about literary texts, uh, a lot of extant literary texts may not be interested in children. Uh, a lot of literary texts, and I'm here thinking of the Greek and Roman worlds, are written by men and they just don't have much of an interest in the lives of children. Another problem with literary texts is that they often focus on elites and they're often interested in major events, political events, uh, warfare, those sorts of things. Um, whereas material culture gives you an insight into all sections of society and it doesn't just focus on a narrow set of interests. Material culture also allows us uh, to get an insight and some evidence for the lived realities of children's lives. Uh, so we can actually see the kinds of objects that uh, children would have been using, the kinds of things that would have been used in the care of children, and we actually get a sense of their lives from these objects. And these objects can, in some cases, be very, very evocative of their lived experiences. We also find that material culture can encode cultural val values and provide access to attitudes towards children. In objects aren't just functional things, they have uh, symbolic elements in many cases. And if we look more deeply at the objects, we can get a sense of a society's values and uh, how they think about certain issues. The last point is if we're dealing with material culture uh, from the archaeological record, it's unbiased. Uh, it's not written by an individual with a particular agenda that they want to pursue. Uh, it's produced by the whole society. The caveat here is that uh, our interpretation is obviously not unbiased. Uh, how we choose to read that archaeological record is often problematic and certainly in the past women and children have been overlooked by archaeologists. I'm going to hand over to Sally now uh, who's going to talk through uh, a few more slides and focus on the Greek world and then I'll come back towards the end and have a look at some uh, Roman material. And I need to do the slides don't I Sal? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So how exactly do we go about identifying children in the archaeological record? The, there's several um, different ways we can do this. Uh, one is through their physical remains, so skeletal remains, either from inhumation or uh, cremation which can give us clues about disease, uh, nutrition, cause of death, gender. Also, the remains um, and the treatment of those remains, including grave goods, reveal a lot about attitudes towards death and towards children. So in Greek burials, for example, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that the older the children are, the more important it is to signify their gender. So the grave goods increasingly reflect gender as the children get older. We also have grave markers, uh, which can uh, combine epigraphic inscriptions, which give us details of the names of children, their age on death, familial relationships, and may also be accompanied by um, an image, an iconographic image of the, the child as well. 
this leads us on to artistic representations. Uh, you can see an artistic representation on the right of this slide. So this is a red figure pilike, um, an Athenian painted pot. And you can see here uh, some proud parents with their offspring crawling. Uh, the child here doesn't look like a, a crawling child uh, or how we would perceive one to look. Um, this brings us to one of the issues with artistic representations, um, how accurate they are. And certainly with Athenian painted pottery, the painters don't appear to have been particularly skilled at representing children. So we often get these kind of adults in miniature. So age signs are not always clear, and I'll be talking about an object in just a minute where this is an issue. We have a range of child-specific objects, and Andy, if you just do the next slide, I can show an example. So here we have a black figure potty, so an object which is specifically used by a child, uh, not from our collection, unfortunately. This is from the Athenian Agora, uh, with a good example of experimental archaeology as they, uh, the excavators shoved, literally shoved their child into this potty. Uh, not a happy child. I think, Andy, if you just click, we have a, a second attempt at this with another child who fits a little more comfortably into the potty. And on the right there, you can see... Um, a small Athenian painted jug, which shows a, a, a small child in one of these kind of potty high chairs. It's actually holding a, a little rattle in their hand. If you pop back to the previous slide, Andy. So there are some specific objects that are used by children. There's other objects that we think may have been used by children, um, but we can't be sure they're exclusively used by children. And there's also, of course, objects that we would associate with adults, which we assume children would have used. Clothing and footwear rarely survives from the Greek and Roman uh, worlds, but this is another source of evidence for us. So if we skip forward a couple of slides, so some of the problems with this evidence um, that we uh, think are significant, um, first of all, obviously the archaeological record is distorted. So some categories of objects are much more visible than others simply because they survive. So pottery, uh, stone um, survive particularly well. Uh, whereas other materials such as leather and wood, organic materials don't survive. Um, the example here is one of the little shoes that we've just been talking about um, from Vindolanda, a child's shoe which survives there in the anaerobic conditions at that site. Metalwork survives relatively well, or it although it is a material that can be reused, so is um, maybe melted down and reworked. Uh, skeletal remains aren't always diagnostic. Um, certainly if we're dealing with, with cremation from the Greek and Roman world where, where quite a lot of bones do survive, it's not always easy to identify the age. Um, and some adult skeletons can be mistaken for children. I've talked a little bit already about the issues with artistic skill, which can perhaps make it difficult to identify children. But also we need to remember when we're looking at representations that they are representations, they're not a snapshot or a photograph of reality. So we have artistic convention and also the, the kind of ideological um, implications behind the image to consider. So the reading of these images isn't straightforward, just like the reading of literary texts isn't. Um, 
The final point here, object function is not always clear. So we're going to look at some examples in a moment of objects which have been identified as toys. But that is not to say that they could not have had another use in antiquity and they may not necessarily be connected with children. So the next slide. So the first, I'm just going to talk very briefly about a few of the objects in the Shefton collection of um, Greek archaeology in Newcastle in the Great North Museum. The first of these is an Athenian red figure, Kous, a little jug, um, which belongs to the later 5th century BC. There are about a thousand of these small jugs surviving in the archaeological record. Um, they're found in Athens and the, survive, uh, the surrounding territory, so they're not exported. And they relate to a very specific Athenian ritual called the Antisteria, which is a celebration of a child reaching the age of three. The majority of these jugs show boys, not surprisingly, but we do have some images of girls as well. And in this festival, children would have their first drink of wine um, at the age of three, which would be held in this little jug. I've got, luckily, um, a replica. This isn't the real thing that I've got at home. Um, this is a little replica, but just to give you an idea of the size of our jug, and they really range in size um, from being really tiny um, to a little bit larger than this one. So the first thing to note about this representation is it certainly doesn't look like a three three-year-old. And again, we've got these issues with um, age signs and conflicting um, ideological symbolism, I suppose. So what was important about these vessels is that they show the engendering of children. And for Greek uh, male children, what was really important here was physicality physicality, so developed muscles, which you wouldn't find on a three-year-old child, but are represented clearly here. These jugs are found in children's graves. Uh, one of the interesting things um, that is clear is that sometimes these jugs are put into the graves of younger children, so babies, and it seems that they are intended to offer a projected life course to this deceased child. So offering them um, the, the ritual jug for a ritual that they wouldn't have the chance to participate in. We move to the next slide, Andy, please. So here we have some feeding cups. In the Shefton collection, we actually have uh, four of these little cups. And again, just to give you an indication of size, this is a 3D print of the cup on the right. I'm not sure how clearly you can see that when I'm holding it, but you can see that it's really quite tiny. Um, these little feeding cups offer us a glimpse into children's lives. There's been um, some work on prehistoric feeding cups to look at the contents of these, um, which suggests that cow's milk and pig's milk was used in these cups. We're hoping to get some contents analysis on our examples um, sometime in the near future. You can see um, on some examples, particularly those found in the Athenian agora, little teeth marks around this, the spout of these little um, cups. There has been debate in the literature as to whether these are feeding cups for infants or whether they may also have been used for invalids or had some other purpose as oil containers. Um, there is one that is in the shape of a breast, 
which is in the collection in Madrid, which seems emphatically to suggest that they were infant cups. We also have a representation of uh, a small terracotta statuette, which shows a mother feeding her child with one of these cups. So move on to my final objects now. So on the left of the screen, you can see a small terracotta tortoise. And again, I've got a 3D print here, which shows you really how tiny this object is. We think it was a children's toy. Um, some tortoises like this have been found in children's graves, which seems to make this connection uh, firmer. But we also know that small terracottas like this were given as votive offerings, offerings to the gods used in ritual. There's a whole range of terracotta animals. So we need to be cautious when we are interpreting these um, in thinking that every example is can be identified with children. We also get little miniature vessels. So pots in the in the same shape as um as as pots used by adults which could potentially have been toys which again would would um give us an indication of the socialization of children learning so so for example for boys we get like little symposium sets the drinking party uh, pots used in the drinking party um but again, these miniatures are also found in sanctuaries and there is a suggestion that they are dedications to the gods rather than children's toys. Finally, on the right there, we have some knuckle bones. These are the bones of um, sheep or goat, which are used to play games in antiquity. So a bit like the, the, the modern um, well, I say the modern game of jacks. None of my students know what jacks is. Um, I think there's a game called Pass the Pig, which is similar. These would be thrown, and the the where the, how they landed would give you different um, give different points. And these examples are bone from from the chef, and we also have a bronze example. What's interesting about these gaming pieces is sometimes they have little drip drilled holes which are filled with lead. Um, so we can see evidence of cheating in this um, game. So these we know were used by children. We have representations of children playing with them on pottery. And we also um, find them again in children's graves. But once more, these objects are also ritual or religious objects. They're dedicated in shrines and in caves. Um, to the gods. So I'm going to hand over to Andy now. He's going to talk about a couple of Roman um, objects. Okay, well, we're moving from uh, the sunny Mediterranean to the, uh, the northern frontier of the Roman Empire, uh, having a look at some material from Hadrian's Wall. And I thought I'd start with a couple of children's grave markers, grave stones. Um, we have here uh, a tombstone to uh, an individual called Aurelius Concordius from the Roman fort at Bird Oswald. And the inscription, uh, I'll, I'll just translate it. It's to the spirits of the departed and Aurelius Concordius. He lived one year, five days, son of Aurelius Julianus, the Tribune. So we have here, uh, some interesting evidence that shows us uh, or reminds us that infant mortality in antiquity was hugely common. Uh, you were doing very well if you survived past the age of 10 in the Roman Empire. Uh, a lot of uh, children died in infancy and uh, Aurelius Concordius here is an example. Uh, his father is a senior military officer and wants to mark uh, his son's death, uh, hence the uh, grave marker here. Um, and the other thing that's quite interesting is that in the Roman Empire, until you were a year old, um, 
you're not really recognised as a citizen. I mean, it's once you're a year old, uh, you gain some legal privileges which could lead to citizenship. So Aurelius Concordius here is just five days over that really significant milestone in childhood in the Roman Empire. And uh, this is uh, quite a, a, a moving object, really, uh, to someone who's died so young. Um, the other one is uh, a tombstone from Great Chester's Roman Fort, and it's a tombstone set up to an individual called Pervica. And the inscription, uh, it's not very legible on my uh, photograph, unfortunately, but it says, to the spirits of the departed and his daughter Pervica. And I put this example in because Sally was talking about artistic representation. Um, this is an interesting example of exactly that. Uh, this is a tombstone in a Roman tradition where you have a representation of the individual and it's set in a sort of arch, an architectural feature, but the carving is distinctly non-Roman. When you look at uh, Pervica's arms, for example, they're, they're just weird. Uh, the way her body's represented is not the sort of naturalistic representation of a body from the classical world. And here, I think we've got a very interesting marriage of local artistic traditions and ideas and Roman artistic traditions, producing something that's uniquely British and provincial. Um, obviously, trying to understand children's clothing or appearance from evidence like this is, is quite tricky. Uh, but uh, we can make, uh, make some attempts with, with this sort of evidence. Moving on, uh, in our collection, we also have uh, a couple of children's coffins. Uh, there's a lead child's coffin from Benwell and a sandstone child's coffin from, coffin from Clavering Place in Newcastle. This is pretty close to where the central station in Newcastle is, which is where the cemetery for the Roman fort of Newcastle was located. So Roman cemeteries are outside of the boundaries of where people live. They're set outside of there. And these two coffins are both from quite high status burials. Um, it takes quite a lot of money to have that much lead for a coffin. Um, and the stone coffin, again, uh, a very elaborate uh, piece of uh, material culture here, a great deal of effort into making this. And there were some skeletal remains inside this coffin alongside a really nice uh, Roman cup, uh, high status pottery called Caster Ware. Uh, unfortunately, this sandstone coffin was excavated uh, quite a long time ago. And the kinds of sophisticated analysis of human remains that would take place today just weren't available. And I think this is something to bear in mind that there are much more uh, archeological techniques we can bring to bear on human remains. I'm just looking at my watch and I'm a bit conscious of time. Uh, so I'll just very quickly move on to this slide. Uh, Sally talked about toys. There's a bit of evidence for toys along Hadrian's wall. Um, this is uh, an example of a bone leg from an articulated doll. So a doll with moving limbs. Um, these aren't very common. Uh, along Hadrian's Wall, uh, but we do have a couple of examples of these kinds of dolls. And then we also have two wooden swords, uh, one from Vindolanda and one from Carlisle. Wood doesn't normally survive in the archaeological record, and you usually have to have very damp or extremely dry conditions to find wooden material. We know the Roman army used wooden swords for training, but these two are very light and are more likely to be child's, children's toys than uh, actual military uh, practice weapons. Very quickly, uh, my last slide. Um, I think when you're approaching material culture, you can read an object just as you can read a text. And it's knowing the sorts of questions to ask and what to think about when you're looking at an object. And there's a whole range of questions you can ask when interpreting something. 
Uh, you can start by thinking about the basics, like what's it made from, how is it made, those sorts of things. You can ask questions about where was it found. And we've been looking mainly at material from funerary contexts, uh, certainly for the Roman material, uh, the tombstones, the uh, coffins, and those sorts of things. But if it's found in the remains of a house, uh, you might think about the location and what it tells you about children within an ancient house. You can ask questions about an object's function. Sally talked about the feeding cups. Are they used for children or might they be used for invalids? You can look at the date of an object and think about its general significance to the society which produced it. And just to finish off, I, uh, I've put an example, a nice example of a gravestone uh, from Carlisle. This is actually in Tully House Museum. And I put this one up because it's a real contrast with the Pervica gravestone. This is carved by someone with a more sophisticated approach to carving stonework. Um, I'm assuming this is a much more high status burial. The woman depicted is wearing elaborate clothes. Her fan is a real statement fan there. She sat on an elaborate chair and she's got her son next to her, um, which is interesting in thinking about representations of childhood. And he's petting a bird that sat on the woman's lap. And we can get a sense of the sort of clothing he's wearing. He's got an undergarment, a tunic and a cape on. And we can think about the architectural setting. And there's a lot more uh, I could say about this, but uh, I'm looking at my watch and thinking I've, I've actually slightly gone over time. Uh, so uh, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for listening.